we're going to look at some particular examples of creating wave interference that use different experimental situations. In this case, we're going to look at something called the two-slit experiment, where we create effectively two point sources by passing a plane wave through a barrier with two slits in it. The two-slit experiment looks something like this, where you have an original plane so uh, wave source, which is in this case a, coming from a spherical wave, and it's emanating outwards to the point where it's almost a plane wave by the time you get to a, a barrier. The barrier has a pair of slits in it, and each slit now acts like a source for uh, a circular waves to come out, so it acts like two point sources. Since the plane wave came into the barrier at the same time, then these two point sources are going to be what's called in phase. They're going to oscillate up and down together. So these are now my two point sources, and it looks a lot like the situation we were sketching before, which has two point sources, two fingers in the water oscillating up and down. In the region beyond the two slits, we'll see a similar interference pattern as we did for two point sources, crests and troughs overlapping, and we'll have nodal lines and antinodal lines. If we place a second uh, screen along this uh, system, we'll notice that the nodal lines project outwards and reach a place where the amplitude of the oscillations are large. And the nodal lines will project out, outwards and create a region where the oscillations of the wave are small. And the antinodal lines will project outwards and hit a place where the, on the screen the wave oscillations are rather large. A simulation of this might look like this, where I have a spherical wave coming out, creating something where I have two point sources seeing crests and troughs at the same time. And now in the region beyond the barrier, beyond those two slits, these two things act like point sources. The nodal lines, which are uh, those regions which are dark, and I've outlined them right there, all the nodal lines project outward toward the screen in such a way that they line up. And so there's a, a region that's dark on the screen and another region that's dark on the screen. The antinodal lines, the regions where there's large wave amplitudes, also project outwards and these reach the screen at certain locations. Those we'll call bright spots. If we were to graph the intensity of the wave at the screen, we would see peaks where the bright spots are and uh, dark spots or troughs uh, where the nodal lines are. And so this graph here, which plots intensity versus location, would go up and down, not quite like a sine wave. And these dark spots line up with the nodal lines, and the bright spots line up with the antinodal lines. The equations for this, the dark and light spots, are relatively easy to understand. Wave fronts coming from the two slits arrive at, the, at a given location somewhat out of phase. For example, if we look at the angle theta 2 and ask which waves reach that location up here marked by theta 2, notice that the slit that's coming down, uh, that's from down here, has to send waves up further to get to that location than the slit that's sending waves up from up here. How do I see that? Well, let's draw pictures where we see the wave fronts coming from each of the two slits arriving at that location marked by theta 2. The wavelength lambda is, right, is indicated right here. That's the wavelength of either of these two waves. The, t the lower of the two wavelengths has to make up some extra distance. We can draw a little triangle, a right triangle, where the hypotenuse is d, the distance between the two slits. And if that's a right angle, then this side of the triangle is d times sine of theta, or sine of theta 2. That's the amount of extra distance that the lower wave has to make up to catch up with the upper wave. Constructive interference, like what's shown here in this picture, theta 2 is a place where there's a peak. So that's constructive interference, or a bright spot on the screen. That happens when these two waves arrive in phase, and in fact that seems to be happening right here, that we have um, at this moment two troughs are arriving, so that's two large amplitudes in the negative direction. But of course as the wave fronts keep coming, it'll be crests in a second. 
We have constructive interference whenever the two waves are exactly a multiple of a wavelength out of phase. So that's when we write down d sine of theta 2 is equal to a multiple of a wavelength. That's the condition for constructive interference. Destructive interference, like in this place where there's a trough at location theta 1, that occurs whenever the, the waves from the two slits arrive out of phase. So let's draw a picture of that. Here's a wavefront coming from the upper slit. Here's a wavefront coming from the lower slit. And again, the wavefront from the lower slit has to make up some extra distance. If we draw a little right triangle, that's, that distance is d sine of theta number 1. And we know that the condition for destructive interference is when that, that path difference is a multiple of a half wavelength. So we're going to write d sine of theta 1 is m, which is going to be an integer, plus a half times wavelength. That's the condition for destructive interference anywhere along the screen. If you remember, the condition for a bright spot for uh, two wave fronts passing through two slits uh, and reaching a back screen is d sine theta is a multiple of a wavelength. Notice what happens for a given d. As lambda gets smaller, if you were to change the color of the wavelength, then theta has to get smaller. d is a fixed distance. It's the distance between the two slits that you construct in this two-slit experiment. And lambda is the wavelength of the light. If lambda gets smaller for the same d, then theta will get smaller. In other words, the two, two adjacent bright spots will get closer together. So if we t shine green light through a two-slit experiment, the two adjacent bright spots are closer together than if we shine red light, which has a larger wavelength, uh, through two, the same two-slit experiment. And you can even see that in this photograph the two red spot, dark bright spots are closer together than the two green bright spots. All of the interference effects that we're going to be studying in this class only occur if the dimensions d of your apparatus are comparable to the wavelength lambda of the wave that we're trying to study. In fact, one of the ways we can say that we've proven wave-like behavior, wave-like behavior of something, is to say that we've seen an interference effect, and we do so whenever we can create an apparatus that has a D comparable to the wavelength that we're trying to, to nail down. If lambda gets too small, imagine what happens. These angles get really, really small, and all these interference patterns get squished in towards theta of zero, because when lambda becomes infinitesimally small, then all the thetas become small, and we just see a bright dot. We don't see any of the, the ripples of these interference maxima and minima. So indeed, we only get to actually study interference if we can create a D, an apparatus that has a dimension comparable to a wavelength, so that we can see the, lamp, the thetas that are measurably large.